Good afternoon, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola's celebration of the life of Rob Palme. My name is Laura Keith King, and my pronouns are she and her. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for joining us on Zoom and for watching the video that will be on YouTube later. We are so happy to see you and grateful for your presence. Rob and his family have been pillars of this church for decades, and we are honored that his daughter, Astrid, has chosen to return here to allow us to dedicate this time to think about Rob and celebrate his life and his many contributions to his family, this church, this community, and the world at large. Some people pass through our lives unnoticed, but Rob was not one of them. Rob was a calm and gentle but impactful presence in our lives here, and he is sorely missed. Now I would like Astrid and Scott and Nora and Kathleen to come up and light these candles because we know that Rob loved candles. As we light our chalice flame and when the family gets back to their seats, please join me in this responsive reading from your hymnal. It is number 445, and it's titled The Womb of Stars. The womb of stars embraces us. Remnants of their fiery furnaces pulse through our veins. We are of the stars. We are of the earth. We breathe and live in the breath of ancient plants and beasts. Our fingers trace the curves carved in clay and stone by forebears unknown to us. We are part of the great circle of humanity, gathered around the fire of the heart of the We gather anew this day to celebrate our common heritage. May we recall in gratitude all that has given us birth. Thank you. Our opening words are by Patricia Sheldon, Never Fully Extinguished. In this hour of holy stillness, we gather to honor the life and the person we love. In this hour of holy stillness, we remind ourselves that the flames of life and love are never fully extinguished. In this hour of holy stillness, we offer ourselves for sharing the weight of each other's grief. In this hour of holy stillness, we offer the strength of our love to help others survive their pain and grief. 
In this hour of holy stillness, we call forth from each of us the power we offer out of life, out of loss, out of love. <coughs> so, most of you who knew Rob knew that he was quite a Renaissance man, demonstrating the ideal Unitarian Universalist. He was widely read and highly educated. He was a traveler, a raconteur, a poet, and a painter, and even a composer. A few years ago, during the COVID quarantine, he sent me a recording of him singing a song he had written. I thought it was just wonderful. And with the help of GarageBand and iMovie, which I had plenty of time to learn in quarantine, <laughs> I made this recording and video for what were then our online church services. His song is posted on YouTube for the world to enjoy now. So now we are going to watch and hear We Are People, written by Rob Palme. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Jack Comstock, an esteemed and highly contributing member of our congregation, who will talk about the life of Rob Palme. We're here to celebrate Rob's life. Rob C. Palme was better known simply as Rob to all of us. He was born in New York City on May 21st, 1933. The first five years of his life, he lived in a housing project overlooking the Fulton Fish Market. Rob also stated that he had an unusual childhood because he spent a considerable amount of time in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> This was an arrangement by Rob's attorney father for, with a Chinese client to pay part of the legal fees in babysitting and cooking lessons. In later life, Rob was a particularly good cook using the wok. I know, I tasted it. He served me a very tasty Chinese stir fry with pot stickers. It was very nice. Rob had many hidden talents, and that was one of them. In 1938, he moved from New York City to Bronxville. It's a small suburb city, north of, just north of New York City. And he attended public schools there. In 1948, entering high school, he attended a private college preparatory school, the Admiral Farragut Academy in New Jersey. This was a military 
uh, preparatory school, and it was named for the first American Navy officer who reached the, the rank of Admiral. This may be a reason why Rob had an interest in the Navy and the sea. After graduating high school, Rob attended Tufts University as a Navy ROTC cadet. Rob graduated Tufts in 1955 with a BA in English. I think you could have guessed that. But his real learning came in doing. He was the editor of the literary magazine and also photography editor of the college yearbook. I think that was impressive. Here he developed his ability and talents to co collaborate with people. He also enhanced his standard of perfection to express himself in precise words so that everybody could understand. On graduation from Tufts, Rob was commissioned and served in the U.S. Navy from 1955 to 1958. First aboard an amphibious troop transport. Then he went to Chicago at the Naval Reserve Center. And finally, aboard a radar picket destroyer escort in the North Atlantic. Rob returned to active duty in Washington, D.C. as a writer for the Navy Reserve. It was this time, during this time, Rob met and married Carly Ruth, who worked in the Norwegian Embassy. Rob and Carrie had one daughter, Astrid. Rob transferred to civil service as a writer for the Navy but in a more supervisory role. In 1975, his position was transferred to here in Pensacola. So him and his family settled here. As an educational specialist, Rob wrote and supervised the writing of user manuals and correspondence courses. Rob's ability to easily understand complex subjects was extremely beneficial in his writing these training manuals. Rob expressed a, a feeling of accomplishment when the Navy personnel he, he was teaching learned by his writings. He ex also expressed letting others take more credit than they, they actually deserved sometimes was very beneficial and got much more done and also created goodwill. In 1991, Rob retired and he had the rank of Lieutenant Commander in the Navy Reserve at retirement. Rob had many interests. Literature, reading were lifelong. Rob always had books and writing projects. Those that knew him knew that well. Rob was always a hands-on person also, and he had many other projects, personal projects. He built a small wooden boat in his garage. He built furniture for the house, beds, and cabinets. He also, for several years, baked sourdough bread that was, um, he said it was good. I think it was. In retirement, Art became a compassion. His wife Carrie was an artist and he assumed that passion also. He began painting. He enrolled in art classes at Pensacola Junior College. He became an active docent an administrator and a trustee of the Pensacola Art Museum of Art. He and his families, and I'm sure you went too, and visited many art museums in Europe. And he visited Carrie's relatives in Norway. 
and I think they took paint, easels, and brushes in hand. The Norwegian landscape was a favorite subject for both Rob and Carrie. Unfortunately, Carrie died in 2010. After that, Rob purchased the boat and became active in the Coast Guard Auxiliary and would monitor events when they would, would have a lot of boats in the Gulf. He sailed with much younger Navy personnel and gave them his experience. Around this time, he found the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. He became a member. He served on several ministerial committees. He was a very active member and a very uh, important person to the church. I can remember Rob was a discussion leader. Every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, he got here. I wasn't quite as punctual, but um, he would lead discussions prior to the serv regular service. I enjoyed these conversations immensely. He didn't have any topic in mind. You came if you had a question, an idea, or didn't understand something. Rob was prepared. He could discuss and stimulate your thought processes. Um, on several occasions, it seemed like he had an Edison effect where my brain lit up. And things became clear, and things that I never thought of, I could see that they were important in that. These were all moments for me, but it was um, ex extremely nice. Although he did not say it, I'm sure that he was a very good financial supporter of the church because it was very important to him. And Rob had many friends here. And he will be missed. Rob was a fine, gentle person, extremely intelligent, but very modest. Um, it was a pleasure to know him, and um, he had a very good life. And now I would like to have Ashford and Scott come up with some readings. As everyone knew, uh, knew Rob, he was a prolific writer and loved his love of the ocean and boats and sailing and, and uh, one of the reasons uh, draw, drew him to, uh, besides uh, work for the Navy, was just the, the beautiful uh, ocean and, and, and scenery of Pensacola. So we found uh, this writing when he was a young Navy sailor uh, aboard a ship patrolling the North Atlantic, uh, probably the tail end of, um, I believe, the Korean War. Uh, but uh, we found this writing and thought it was appropriate if his experiences as a young, a young man on a, driving a ship uh, on watch in the North Atlantic. This is To Drive a Ship by Rob Palmy. First you learn, then you are tested. Hours on the bridge, all time, all weather. With other ships and very much alone. The tests are many and then the Navy trusts you. Seats of paper, one says you can drive the ship and be on the ship, be the officer of the deck. Another says in your absence of the communicating officer, you command the ship. Nice bureaucratic milestones. <laughs> Far more important in that the ship comes to trust you. We have been in heavy, dirty weather. It was mid-watch, about two in the morning. I had the deck and the comm, meaning I was driving the ship, and was in charge of whatever was going on. The captain was at, at his chart table as I was uh, instructing the boatswains what to do under my command. This is the uh, routine for the constantly for three days during the nastiest weather I've seen so far on our journey. And the captain was dozing off at the chart table. We had given up trying to hold a course and we were steering to the left. 
She's, she's going right. He does not take his eyes off the compass, always wants to come right, he replies. Nothing right at 087. Take a broaching in these seas, I say as a reminder, not as an order. Nothing right, I, he replies. Behind me, the quartermaster glances at the compass. We can't hold cur course, sir. What to do? I've been going giving this same order for the last two hours, and no need to give it again. Then there was a slight change in the ship's motion. I felt a deep, big, deeper space between the waves. The helmsman felt it also, and standing more rigidly with a firmer grip on the wheel. Mind your helm, I said. I said, more responding to the men than ordering them. The boat swaying spoke. Rudders right to the left, sir. Steady, 0190. Passing 018, sir. Passing 017. Big waves from the Greenland waters were going doing their best to broach our ship. Passing 050 as we were trying to make the turn in the waves. Most ships will rise to the breaking wave. Destroyers want to bore holes in them. We are on our way to doing that. Passing 030, the voice was a little less tense this time. Calm, engine room, bridge, be prepared to answer the backing of bell port. A man wedged in the corner repeated what I had said in the mouthpiece of his headphone. The ship was rising, bow tilting up. We are climbing the unseen wave. 030 from the helm, our forward motion was slowed and the rudders were now ineffective. Then we were on top of the wave and the wind was blowing the ship uncontrollably. 025, steady, 025. Are running down the back of the wave and points us into the next one. The ship shudders as it dives in the white water over the decks, flooding the windows, flooding the, the crashing of the decks and the crew. The ship pitches up and seems to shake off the water. All heads two thirds. Aye, we are on the last of the dangerous course, I tell myself. The ship can handle much more punishment. Wave after wave, more dark cold water welling at our round windows. Then it is less. I have the ship back on course and awaken the captain. I think we're pretty far of our course, sir. <laughs> <laughs> come day, the captain responds, coolly, come day, we'll have to turn back. I hope this doesn't happen again. <laughs> think you can handle it next time? <laughs> I did it this time, Rob responds. <laughs> I don't know what the next time will be like, but I am sure of this watch now. Kathleen briefly puts his hand on my shoulder and retires to his chart table. <laughs> <laughs> the only other person that came up to me after that was the boat's mate. Can we get sub pay for this? <laughs> I respond coolly. You mean all 15 minutes of it? <laughs> Thank you. So that was, uh, yes, we found this as one of his writings, and, and I don't do justice to words like Rob did, as he was a very eloquent speaker and uh, had a lot of passion for writing and so on. But so, thank you all. So my piece is a, a poem by a Norwegian poet, uh, Enric. Uh, uh, it was inspired uh, for mom's service. Uh, Dad chose a poem from the same poet uh, titled Til min gilden lak, and uh, it translates roughly into uh, To my, my Golden Flower. Uh, and in looking for a decent translation of that, uh, I actually came across this other one, which I thought was quite suiting. And it's called uh, Sister Ice and translates to The Sailor's Last Voyage. This voyage is the last for me. Sing, sailor, O. Oh. Next port of call shall heaven be. Sing, sailor, O. Oh. The last bell soon the air will rend. Your compass you must closely tend. Like gold and diamonds all around, the heaven's sea with isle abound. 
They are the stars so small and clear at which on night watch you would peer. Take courage then and risk defy while sailing up through azure sky. Fear not the devil's fierce corsairs, no danger of his wily snares. You'll meet your wife, you'll meet your friend, your children you will meet again. Then there will be much greater glee than here when you came home from sea. Sing, sailor, oh. Those were both beautiful in their own ways. Thank you. Next, we are going to stand, if we are willing and able, so that we can sing number 295, Sing Out Praises for the Journey. That's 295 in your gray hymnal. be seated. We have one final reading, but please join us for refreshments in the conference room. And thank you for joining us on video and Zoom. And thank you all for being here. Closing words. A Blessing for the Dying by Michelle Buhait. We bless you on your journey. We honor and celebrate the life that has been yours, the lives you've touched, the legacy you leave. We release old wounds and regrets. We forgive and are forgiven. We cherish the life we shared, the life that is larger than us. Out of mystery, we are born, and mystery receives us when we die. With sorrow and gratitude for all that has been, we bless you on your journey. Thank you again for joining us today. And we'll hear some Chopin, which was Rob's favorite.